So anyways, if this is your first time to Wisdom Soup, um, to tell you the idea of Wisdom Soup, it's kind of says it all in the name, is the idea that your spirituality is something that's unique to you, that it is like a soup, that you get to take what resonates for you and everybody gets to make their own soup. And that as you come to these meetups, the idea is for us to just open up and learn and explore different topics and to see what resonates. So take what fits for you, what resonates for you, and then leave what doesn't. And then we all kind of support each other on our path and our growth. And so I tend to choose speakers based on what sounds fun to me. <laughs> and usually that seems to fit for other people too. Um, but we've explored everything from, you know, you think of it, the, the most out there, you know, stuff that I would have thought was crazy 15 years ago, that now, of course, there's fairies, you know, of course, we, <laughs> you know, we talk about dragons and, and crystals and dreams and, you know, all the things. Um, and tonight, uh, the topic is something I think is very, very fitting, given that we are in the month of February, the month of Valentine's. It's all about love. But it's going to be, of course, spiritual love, love of a spiritual nature. So our speaker tonight is, uh, his name is John David Lada. And he, uh, like I said, he said he's right from here in uh, the the uh, Seattle area. And uh, John has an interesting background. He is hilariously describing himself. He said that he, when he entered into his own spiritual uh, process, a spiritual opening that he transformed from, I can't remember exactly how he said it, from a, a rigid, rational male into an accidental mystic, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. And, uh, and I know we can all re relate to that. You know, it is always such a journey for many of us from the head to the heart and learning how to open up our hearts. So his book is about that process, about learning uh, how by staying in his heart, he became increasingly on his spiritual path, increasingly guided and, and experiencing that in his everyday life. So um, and learning that really love is the pathway, love is the way for him to navigate his life. So I thought what a wonderful way for us to uh, to enter into our February Valentine month. So if you guys will help me welcome uh, John Lata. And let me go ahead and pin you, John, so that everyone can see you. Here we go. There we go. All right. Thank you so much, Anne. And thank you, everybody, uh, for joining me here. Would you and like to listen to this? Oh, hold on. We got a couple. Okay. Let me meet some participants. There we go. All right. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and I appreciate the invitation. And uh, yeah, I my wife, Wendy, likes to say uh, my the book that I wrote called The Synchronicity of Love should have been called Rigid Rational Male Transforms into Random Accidental Mystic. And that really has been my journey for the last 20 years. And tonight, what I want to talk about is love, and in particular, self-love, body love, and what I would call the feeling state of love. And so I'm going to try uh, working with all of us here in our, this group online. And so we're going to try and dive into the feeling of love as we go through this tonight. So I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes and... Um, Try and bring up in your mind's eye and your sense of feeling that which you love more than anything else in the world. It can be something you uniquely love. It could be, you know, that look on your dog's face when you come home and he's wagging his tail looking at you. A cat who climbs on your lap and starts purring. Um, a sunrise, a sunset, maybe swimming, walking in nature, touching another person. It could be... Um, a person. It could be Jesus or Mary or Kuan Yin. And so really touch in with that feeling of love in your body and see if you can bring that into your body now. And then holding on to that state, take your hands and bring them to your heart center with reverence. Bring that same state of love that you're feeling in now, and you're bringing it to your body as if you're the beloved touching the beloved. And just stay in your heart center with that, that feeling of love and that feeling of love and reverence for the body. And we're going to call in some help uh, for this 
hour long talk. Um, we're going to call in compassion, stepping into the shoes of another and seeing what they see, feeling what they feel, and knowing what no they know as if the other is you. And we're going to call in healing, that felt sense of being restored, renewed, and made whole again. We're going to call in harmony, that felt experience of bliss and flow. We're going to call in wisdom, experience gleaned through countless lifetimes and universal wisdom and service to humanity. And last, we're going to call in unconditional love, the love that loves for no reason, the love that loves the white sheep and the black sheep the same, the love that loves the whole show, the love that connects us all. It's the love that unites all the opposites, body and mind, masculine, feminine, soul and spirit, heaven and earth. And see if you can just tune into that felt experience of love in the heart center, love in the body. And if you can imagine our group of, it looks like 28 participants, um, take your hands off your heart center and extend your hands out as if we were all just holding hands for a minute so we can all sort of attune and connect with each other. And let that love that you're feeling flow out your hands into our circle here, into our group, into our gathering. <clears throat> we're sharing that which we feel that which we love that which we love uniquely and the felt experience of being love and then when you're ready bring your hands back to your heart center and tune into your own unique sense of self there's nobody like you on the planet today and there never has been and never will be. It's a very unique and special thing to um, have a human life and experience yourself as an individual. Okay, you ready? Open your eyes. <clears throat> okay. So um, it's been my experience, it's been my journey. Um, as that sort of what I call rigid, rational male who was not spiritual, not woo-woo, uh, not religious, and would never have guessed 20 years ago that he'd be giving a talk on Wisdom Soup about love and unconditional love and the heart center and feelings. And um, But I've learned a lot on the journey about feelings, and I want to share some of that today. And um, uh, the more that you can tune into yourself and your body with love, um, the more the body starts to, um, I should say, your greater awareness starts to become aware of information coming in from subtle realms. And information that comes in through subtle realms comes in first through feeling. And it's afterwards that it comes in the form of thought and, um, and language. And so my understanding um, of you know, moving into greater, greater feeling and greater, greater subtlety, you're in touch with more and more and more. And so there's sort of a practical aspect to hanging out in the heart center, hanging out with unconditional love, bringing love to the body, um, because you simply will become uh, more aware on more levels and you'll be more resourceful in every single situation. And so I, I told um, Anne, I'm going to share a few stories from my book and my own journey uh, and my journey into feeling. And I'm going to go all the way back. Um, I think it was 19 years ago. And I had gone out on a date and with a gal and we were going to go for a run because I was we were both really athletic, but I couldn't keep up because I'd had a chest cold that lasted I'd had for six weeks and I couldn't seem to shake it. And she said, well, you should try seeing my nutritionist. And so I went and fully expected her to say, you know, we're going to change your diet. And instead, she is looking at me over the top of her glasses. And there's this awkward silence. And all of a sudden, she looks at me like this and says, you have grief trapped in your chest, going all the way back to earliest childhood with your mother. And <laughs> it was great. I mean, I later called her an undercover healer. because her, her cover is nutritionist, but she's actually, I think today, what you would call a medical intuitive. 
And so she said, what can you do to cry? And I said, I don't, I don't cry easily, uh, especially in front of other people. And so um, she gave me a homeopathic remedy called lung and said, uh, and I told her, I said, the only time I think I tear up is sometimes watching a sappy movie. And so she said, why don't you go home and watch some sappy movies, take this homeopathic remedy, it's 10 drops twice a day called lung and see if you can cry. And so I tried for weeks and then finally it happened. The log jam broke and um, I was on my knees heaving with grief. And in all honesty, I don't even know what I was crying about, but there was a lot of years of grief pent up there. And I remember when it was done, um, it was very cathartic. I was like, wow, no wonder people do this. <laughs> and, but then what happened in my journey was, um, a bunch of dreams started to come through. And as somebody, when I was younger, who used to fish all the time, um, a lot of my dreams uh, are fishing. And so for me, fishing is sort of a metaphor or symbolizes being a seeker on the journey. And so all of these dreams started coming through uh, where I had a dream where this stout little old Irishman had planted three weeping willows in the middle of a river. And he winks at me and says, this should really improve the fishing. Um, and then I would have dreams where I'm fishing and a woman would come up to me and take my rod away and hand me a new rod. And the new rod was longer and slender and far more sensitive. And so <clears throat> what I was being drawn into by embracing this uh, feeling state and being open to feelings was greater and greater subtlety and greater and greater sensitivity. Um, so um, for me, what got me there was returning to the heart center returning to unconditional love. It was my practice. Um, and I, what I have discovered since then is uh, I see far more in that state than I do through just the intellect alone. I feel far more than I used to. And I'm not just talking about feelings like anger or fear. I'm really talking about feelings that I'm just going to loosely call subtlety and are probably closer to um, what I would call intuition. And so what I've discovered after all these years is the more I hang out with love, uh, the more I, my intuition is elevated, my feeling state into greater and greater subtlety and sensitivity is elevated. And, um, and I just have greater awareness. Um, I'm going to stop and take a breath right there. Um, and did you want to jump in with anything or did anybody have a question at this point? So far, and I wanted to make sure everybody knows if you do have a question for John, if you just put it in the chat, that way I can make sure I hold those questions for him. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it's 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 amazing to hear you describe it. And I think everyone can relate to that, that the how cathartic it is when you do release it. I love that uh, that somebody was able to see in and that you were receptive to that, that you yeah. that you were able to receive that it was grief that you were feeling. And then that set you on your journey. That is an awesome story. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I, uh, I, we've stayed friends ever since. I think that was 20 years ago. So um, I was really grateful for that experience. And the funny thing is, at the time, I knew loosely that Chinese medicine some, said something about um, feelings or emotions get trapped in certain parts of the body. And I learned later that grief can get trapped in the lungs and, and oh. show up as a lot more chest colds, which I'd had my whole life. I was just like, oh, I'm just one of those people. When I get a cold... Um, it's going to drop down in my chest. It's going to hang around for a few weeks. I always called it bronchitis and it was two or three times a year. And I want to say, um, after the big crying episode, after the kind of being open to feelings and letting them move through me instead of suppressing them, all those chest colds went away. I haven't had a bronchitis type chest cold in a decade. And they used to be, like I said, probably three times a year for me. Um, so one of the things I'm, I'm talking about in the group today is um, the importance of the body on the spiritual journey and, um, <clears throat> and how a lot of times I think uh, a lot of us, you know, if we're thinking of the planet ascending and we're thinking of all of life on this planet ascending to a new higher vibration, we don't always think about taking the body with us and um, you know, you talked Anne at the beginning about all those planets being retrograde and now they're all going direct. And, you know, I think one of the things I've noticed in the last 20 years is greater, greater sensitivity to all sorts of energy. 
um, astrological and um, uh, dreams and visions related to ascension. And it's been absolutely essential for me to listen to my body. And man, there are times that I just got to take the day off. I got to take a nap. And I never used to live that way. And um, I, you know, I have times where I wake up and like, geez, I feel like I weigh a thousand pounds. What is going on with me? And so uh, it's my belief that there's never been a more important time to bring love to the physical body, the whole energy body, to care for the body like never before. And I think, you know, Anne, you had talked about it, uh, you know, before we began the show, sort of reaching up and up yeah. here, you could connect with the angels. I, I believe and it could be a thousand years from now that we're in a period where that vibration that you connect to up here is going to eventually come down into the body because it has been my experience. And I share sort of the conclusion in my book that the body is going through this radical, almost nonstop renovation. And so um, I almost think of the journey now, not so much as reaching upwards, but preparing a garden so that that light can come back down into the body. But that requires kind of a nonstop uh, remodeling process. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet a lot of people in this group have, are experiencing that. So, um, so um, one last thing before I jump away, you know, um, moving into greater and greater subtlety and sensitivity with respect to feeling, bringing more and more love and the feeling of love into the body. The thing that's interesting about feelings is that all feelings are neutral. All feelings are like news and information. It's where it becomes troublesome is <laughs> when we think about the feeling. And so many times it's very easy to attach judgment to a feeling. You know, we're overwhelmed with shame or fear or anger, um, grief. You know, there can be a tendency for the mind to attach a thought or a judgment to it. But I think it's important to know going forward that all feelings are neutral. They're just information. They're just barometers for us. Um, do, do I want to answer a couple of questions now, Anne? There's actually an interesting uh, little conversation happening in the chat about okay. what are the meanings of all the different body pains that we have. So I was going to suggest yeah. if people aren't aware of it, there's uh, one great resource is, um, uh, uh, why am I blanking on her name? Hay House, Louise Hay. Louise Hay has a book. Like it's like a, a Bible of all the different aches and pains that you can have and what they mean. And so it's, it's, a, it's a good one. Anyways, but that's a great way to look stuff up. If you know somebody who's got a, you know, a bad hip or a bad this or a bad that, and it'll tell you what they, yeah. Thank you, Wendy. You're saying, uh, Louise, hey, heal your body. Exactly. Yeah, is a great reference. So, and interesting too, like how consistent everything is, even in your choice of words to talk about how we're being remodeled that, that and uh, I think Michael shared in our dream expert is on the call with us too. And that's whenever you see your, your remodeling happening in your dreams, it does mean that you're healing and raising your frequency yeah. and, and that's the symbol. That's what it means. So it's, you're right. We are being remodeled. <laughs> I would add another book besides Louise Hayes book um, is called permanent healing, which kind of proposes a mental emotional um, component to all sorts of problems in the body. And that's another good book as well. Which one is it? Could you repeat the title? It's called permanent healing. Permanent healing. Awesome. Yeah. And there's another, um, Celeste is also suggesting uh, the secret language of your body from Ina, uh, Ina Segal. Yeah. So awesome. Thanks you guys for sharing those great resources. Um, okay. So we're talking about the body again too. And so I, again, I want to keep coming back to love, self-love, body love. And I want to touch briefly on again, care for the body as we're all on this planet going through um, this this um, ascension process, which again, I don't know how much is going to happen in the next day, month, year, decade. Uh, I don't know if this probably is going to be ongoing. It could be for many, many lifetimes. Um, but I, I want to talk briefly about uh, what we sometimes call life force or chi or prana and how important it is to bring that into the body too for greater health and vitality. And for, um, and, and is also what I would call helpful with, again, accessing subtle realms and intuition. And so um, diet, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on diet, but take care of your body with diet. Um, movement, it's not, in my opinion, not so important that we vigorously exercise. I think that's a uniquely individual thing, but I think it is important to move the body in a variety of ways. 
And so um, I want to do a, an exercise and hopefully you'll all join me. And in um, so a lot of you may be familiar that the human body has a, a vertical tube that runs through it. And it starts from the crown of your head, sometimes goes beyond it, down through the body, parallel to the spine and out your perineum down towards the earth. And so I want to just try, it's something you can do anywhere. It actually feels really good. And it's a way to bring more life force, chi or prana into the body. And so um, just sit up in your chair and try and imagine as you inhale, inhaling energy from the earth up through your perineum area in your central channel and going out the top of your head. And so as you inhale, it's like this. And it's a very relaxing feeling. If you can imagine drawing that energy up with your breath from the earth through your central channel out the top of your head. And just try it a few times, just on the inhale, like I'm, I'm inhaling earth energy and it's coming up into the body and, and out through the top of my head. And now let's reverse it. We're going to grab, let's call it uh, the energy of heaven or celestial energy. And on the inhale, the same thing, we're going to bring it like a big funnel down into our body. So on the inhale, now it's inhale and all the way down to the earth. And you can do this anywhere. It's very relaxing. It's just a way of bringing life force into the body. To me, it's an act of self-love and self-care. It feels really beautiful. Um, it's a really way, good way to get grounded. In the perfect human body, I don't know if there's very many of them out there, probably count them on one hand, we have a wide open, clear vertical tube and that energy flows really naturally. And most of us uh, have kinks in it, knots in it, gunk in it. <laughs> And you might say over time, we're learning to kind of clear out that vertical tube. And there can come a point where you will feel that vertical flow both up and down nonstop through the body. But in the meantime, it's kind of a helpful practice to try and just imagine pulling that earth energy up and that celestial energy down. And now what I want to do is we're going to come back to that feeling state of love. Come back and put your hand or your hands on your heart center again and to the degree you can touch in with that feeling state of love. And if you need to bring up an object or a person or a pet or nature situation, feel that love in your heart center. And now um, I, we're gonna make some wisdom soup right now, Anne. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is pull that energy again from below uh, like imagine inhaling up, but now the energy just stops in your heart center. And at the same time, that energy pulling it down from above and it lands in your heart center. So it takes a little practice, a little work. And on the inhale, you're both pulling up and pulling down. And so that life force from above and below is mixing with that love in your heart. And so it looks like this on the inhale, the energy is coming up and down into your heart. Hold it there in that feeling state of love. And on the exhale, try and imagine that feeling of love permeating out into your whole body, like a tingly sense of love. Your cells will love it. Inhale from above and below. Let it mix with love in your heart center. On the exhale, let it just permeate your body. So I've been practicing this a while. Every time I do it, it feels so freaking relaxing. It feels like tingly bliss in the body. And again, this is a cool thing about this. Is it's free. It doesn't cost any money. It just takes a little practice and you can do it anywhere. You can do it in your car. You can do it in an airport. You can do it, you know, you know, 20 times a day, just for a minute here and a minute there. And, um, and again, my understanding, my journey I think this is a helpful thing to do to the body to help the body on this ascension process. This inhaling from above and below of life force, bringing it into that felt sense of love. And on the exhale, let that feeling of love just spread throughout the whole body and just touch every cell in your body.
So, and when you're ready, just open your eyes. And Anne, when you're ready, if um, if you have any more questions or comments, or is there anybody in the chat that has a question, we could take a break here. There's, I think everybody was still talking about that other part. And sorry, I'm just recognizing okay. there's a few people that didn't have the proper link. So I'm responding to that as we're going. Okay. <laughs> so I'll let you continue okay. with your yeah. guidance. I'll talk a little bit more. So, um, um, uh, from my point of view, one of the best things you can do for yourself, for your body, for your journey is increase what I would call the capacity to love. And, and literally just spending time in the heart center, even if it's for a minute, that felt sense of love, bringing in the life force, letting it spread throughout the whole body. Um, you know, I, a lot of you here, I'm sure, are familiar working with angels and guides. There are bajillions of unemployed angels out there and beings that if you call them in and say, I want you to help me with this feeling of unconditional love, this feeling of compassion. Um, I want you to help me increase my capacity to love. And, um, and the more time you spend out, spend there, the more I just believe it's really helpful to the journey that probably all of humanity is on right now. Um, and I want to talk about in relation to love, uh, I'll talk briefly about uh, triggers, things that trigger us. I mean, it's really hard sometimes to stay in the state of love. <laughs> um, at least it is for me. And in the course of a typical day or a week, uh, you know, I might run the whole gamut of emotions, but uh, what I find is, <clears throat> uh, when I'm angry, when I'm scared, when I'm sad, you know, just allowing myself to move through them and then returning to love and compassion over and over again and practicing forgiveness. Um, part of my journey is it feels like the more I know, the more I realize how much there is to know. I don't know if anybody, anybody can ever really know everything. And, <clears throat> and it's, um, it can be easy to get stuck in, anger or fear directed towards other people. And I was very fond of all of the Edgar Cayce books and Edgar Cayce material. And I'm sure many of you here are familiar with Edgar Cayce, but one of the great things that Edgar Cayce brought to the world, um, you know, I think there's just under 10,000 cataloged uh, medical readings that Edgar Cayce did um, in the Edgar Casey Research Center in Virginia Beach. And a lot of people have summarized all these readings. These are readings primarily of a medical nature where people went to Edgar Casey because the doctors at the time had, you know, they, there was nothing the doctors could do for them. And so they would go to Edgar Casey and this, what I would call a collective would speak through Edgar and say, yes, we have the body here and proceed to make a perfect diagnosis and a suggested treatment regimen. But if you summarize all those 10,000 readings, what you see is the health of the body is related to diet. We all know that. Movement, not so much, much exercise, but movement, we know that. Um, uh, he talked about there was a lot of, um, frankly, people were having problems and the illnesses weren't being properly diagnosed. Uh, there would be injuries, say, to the spine, but it would show up in other parts of the body. So that's a difficult one, what I would call undiagnosed injuries. But the big one was the effect of emotion on the body, both positive and negative. And he, there's one of the stories in there about a woman that had, I think she'd had migraines for a long, long time and, and was pretty much convinced that migraines couldn't be cured. And Edgar is like, okay, we have the body in front of us. And the voice that spoke through said, you've been angry at your ex-husband for 20 years. That's your problem. <laughs> And so he sometimes called the godfather of holistic medicine now, because I think we are learning more and more to bring in this feeling nature and the variety of feeling states and which ones are helpful and harmonious to the body and which ones are disharmonious and can kind of trip up the body. So uh, everybody's journey is unique and everybody's going to feel the whole range of feelings on the human journey. I think that's one of the special things about being human. But I think it's helpful to the 
degree that we can, that we don't get stuck in what we I'd call the really painful negative emotions. And, um, and there's a jillion things that you can't change uh, about the world and you can't change about other people, but you can increase your capacity to love and affect the amount of love you bring to yourself, your body and to others. That is something you can work on. It's good for you. It's good for everybody. And it's free. Um, any questions, Anne? There's actually a few more resources. Okay. People have been, the chat's been okay. great, actually. Yeah. We've got, uh, um, people are commenting and saying, uh, and, and Nika was suggesting, she was saying that she's got like body humming that's happening all the time. So then uh, um, Camelia was, oh, and we've got Camelia saying that uh, as she's a holistic practitioner. She suggests another book, which is called The Encyclopedia of Ailments and Diseases, How to Heal Conflicted mm -hmm. Feelings, Emotions, and Thoughts at the Root of Illness by Jacques Martel. So it's really on point with what you're saying and yeah. what you're talking about. Um, Brittany is asking if it could be her, uh, that she could be experiencing Kundalini, Kundalini awakening, which would be pretty cool. And then you said you were going through that, weren't you, John? Yes. Um, Did you experience it as a buzzing or a humming in your body? <laughs> there was way more than that. <laughs> I'll share briefly. So, um, this is a, a funny story. I think it's funny. Uh, it's funny for me because like I said, I was just, I didn't even know what the word meant. And um, so I um, ran a consumer products company and I had the chance to sell my products on QVC, the home shopping network. And, um, and I, they told me there would be 700,000 new viewers every minute. And so I was nervous. I was scared. I'd never been on live TV before. So I went on, I had my seven minutes of fame. I didn't screw up. Uh, I sold a fair amount of product, not a lot, but not a little. Went back to my hotel room in Philadelphia and I was just feeling all this joy in my body. And I just assumed it was because I didn't screw up on TV and kind of the relief afterwards. And, um, but I couldn't go to sleep and I had to get up at five in the morning to fly home the next day. My body was on West Coast time, but it was on the East Coast. And at midnight, I'm laying there, still not sleeping, kind of half dozing. And all of a sudden, I feel this insane um, orgasm in my perineum, which I didn't even know was possible. And I felt the <laughs> talk about feelings. I felt the poof of what I call orgasmic honey go through my whole body. And I'm like, what the hell was that? And then a few minutes later, it happens again and again and again. And while I was a part-time Catholic at best growing up, the Catholic boy in me was like, what the hell is going on? Is this, you know? And another part of me was like, I don't know, but it sure feels good. And um, <laughs> I flew home, emailed some people that I thought might know what it was. And they said, it sounds like Kundalini, check it out. And so I looked it up and I bought some books. And what happened in me from that day forward was about every second or third day, what I would call the energy would come. And some of it was classic Kundalini where you feel the energy moving up through the spine. But for me, I was assaulted with energy. I, there was times I literally felt I had heart paddles put on me and I was just, it was that unbelievably painful, blowtorch, heat, uh, unbelievably <laughs> blissful states. And, you know, I think if you understand that I'd been living a life as a very rigid, rational male slash man, very masculine, competitive, everything that was crashing in with that kundalini energy was would be what most people would call feminine and most people call um, kundalini energy earth energy sexual energy primal energy feminine energy yes it was all of those that's exactly what it felt like and my dreams were suddenly full of beautiful goddesses <laughs> all ages all shapes all nationalities and um and and it was funny, in my earlier career, I was a store manager for QFC, the grocery chain here locally, and I managed a bunch of stores. And I remember having a dream where I was back at QFC, and, I'm, and I don't know how it works anymore, because all the women are running the store now. They're like, oh, it's okay, John, we're going to show you how it works now. And so for me, that whole kundalini energy and just unbelievably blissful, graceful filled experiences was... Um, uh, I, I think I'd been out of balance for a long time. And so the energy was very feminine, full of goddesses, full of snakes, full of serpents, full of cobras. I would wake up in strange yoga positions and I didn't even do yoga. And that's how it was for years, actually. 
And, that's um, amazing. That yeah. is an amazing uh, awakening. I, that's yeah. a true, I hear a lot of people who like, they might've had Kundalini or they might yeah. attribute it, but that's unmistakable. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I learned later, I, I consulted with a lot of people and talked about this. And it's interesting. I met a woman who she didn't have that experience. She had a full on Kundalini awakening. And she said, everything that came on board for her was masculine. Mm. And I was like, wow, I've never heard that before. And she said, yeah, I think Kundalini energy is actually just balancing energy. Yes. And I suspect because I was so unbalanced, that's why it was so extreme in my case. <clears throat> I think if other people maybe are going through life and they have more of a balance between masculine and feminine, they're not really out of balance. It might be more subtle. It might be not so extreme. Mine was very extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty yeah. awesome though, in yeah. terms of, <laughs> of, uh, letting you know for sure. That, and I love that your dreams were all reflecting the change too. That is super amazing, but yeah, yeah. it makes perfect sense that cause a Kundalini is like two, it's almost like what you see that in the hermetic, the, the medicine staff of the two snakes intertwining, going up the spine, yep. sort of like DNA is two, like a double helix. And there's yeah. the male and the female rising up. Yeah, super cool. Well, it's really fascinating. And this is this is all part of my talk and it's part of my book and it's been part of my journey. Um, in the classic Hindu texts about Kundalini, the, the Shakti awakens and rises up and meets Shiva in the crown and they enjoy union. And my understanding of that is masculine and feminine in union in the crown. And um, But here was my experience with <laughs> all this crazy kundalini energetics um which honestly was both terrifying and probably one of the most exciting times at least in my inner world of my entire life and then it all started to quiet down and started to disappear and in a way there was kind of this felt sense of like oh i really <laughs> miss that <laughs> and it became very still for a while and um and uh in some ways that was the most difficult part of the journey this feeling sense like nothing's happening nothing's happening. Like I had all this for what? And then I remember it like yesterday, this profound um, vision, I was meditating and I could see hints of it, like it was coming. And, uh, and so one of my first visions while meditating was that suddenly the crown of my head was wide open and there was a serpent made of light. It's with qualities like water that was up here looking, just checking things out hmm. and then would disappear. And then all of a sudden, about a week later, crown opens again, and then comes what I call the descent of light, like oh, a shit pile of light came down into my body. And in my experience was it all landed in my root chakra, which like a, looked like a big giant red basement. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a voice that, because then there was the sense of me wanting to step into that, but a voice said it's premature, like this light is going to do its thing. Just let it. There's nothing for you to do. And so this is why I am teaching this now and why I say in my book, I, I think for me, the journey has been remodeling the body and then more light coming into the body. And I've heard some people say the soul is very large and it's only a very small part of us that's embodied. And the goal is really to bring more soul down into the body. And that has been my journey. It's like, here comes the remodel, here comes more light. And, um, and so that's why I'm talking about this today. I have a hunch that this is what's really going on. And, it, you know, if I don't know if we're going to be the higher 3D or the 4D or the 5D in the long run, but, you know, hopefully we're all carried that, carrying that in an embodied state, not something we have to reach outside of ourselves for. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. That's yeah. that I believe we're moving towards a state where the more embodied we are, the it more potently we can then become reality creators and yeah. that the body is the, basically it's like the prism that focuses the light that we contain. So it has to happen from inside of here. And most of us are disembodied. So, you know, or, or only partially embodied, like you said. So yeah, it yeah. is, it is trying to make the body a cleaner vehicle that, so that it can carry us. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. I, I'll share an experience too. Uh, it was, four months after the Kundalini happened and man, there was so much happening to me. And I, I, by the way, I'm a single dad with a company that's like basically on the edge of bankruptcy. I've got two kids. <laughs> it was just like, it was, you know, was, and I was involved in their lives, coaching the ball teams. And I'm having all these experiences too. And, 
the only real fear was that I was somehow going to be weird or incapacitated. But luckily, the energy knew exactly how far to push me and when to back off. And so there was a lot of fear about that. But about four, well, almost right after it happened, you might say I became a healer, except I never took the Reiki class. And, and I didn't even have to do anything. I'd be in public places and this tremendous energy would move through me and go into another person. It's like, wow, I wonder if the waitress is feeling this, you know? <laughs> and um, anyway, it was, and anyway, I had this experience once where I was with another individual and we were doing like a, a healing practice. And I, you know, again, and we talked, you know, before the show here, I have not generally been clairvoyant, uh, at least not when I'm awake, just in my day-to-day -day world. But all of a sudden I look up and there's Mother Mary in all of her glory, like as clear as I'm looking at my computer right now, like I couldn't believe it. And she's in what I think you would call her light body. And before I could say, holy cow, you have Mary's here. My experience of it was she came into my body, filled my body with I, what I would call ecstasy, like so much ecstasy, the, the biggest concern was I thought my body was going to blow up. Oh my God. And, and so again, this is another, this is just part of my journey. It's like, wow, the vibration that divinity resides in is so far beyond where our human bodies are. And, um, and anyway, it was love beyond belief. I, it was ecstasy really. And just when I was going, I'm going to blow poof, it was over. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, interestingly, I met a lady years later who does full body channelings of Mother Mary. And I think I said, I think I know what that is. So <clears throat> we have an interesting question that, yes. that just came in, which is uh, what is your felt experience of self-love? Has that shifted with these other awakenings? Um, my felt experience of self-love, what it feels like to me, the feeling state is gratitude. And yes, uh, you know, like other people, I'm sure I have ups and downs and days, but there's this sense of self-love that's there that's rock solid. And no matter how bad my day has been or whatever, I come back to that and it feels real. It doesn't feel like I'm faking it till I make it. Like there's this sense of profound gratitude for life, for my individual existence, uh, for my body. And um I don't think, and my wife teases me about it. She calls me the healthy narcissist, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause I, I mean, it's, um, I, I don't think I had a lot of barriers to it in the beginning. Um, and it's not something that I, every day, like I have to give myself more self-love, but just in hanging out in the heart center, um, it just came about naturally and kind of organically. Uh, I hope that answers your question. So, so the, it's, felt, the felt sense is gratitude. And, and would you say that before that, uh, like was the transition to that feeling state of self-love, what was the journey, would you say, to get there? Was it something that just came over you? Was it an awareness? What would you say the journey was to get well, there? Well, I think, um, remember you just talked a minute ago about sort of cleaning up the body. And so I think in some ways from the beginning, I've been cleaning up the body, cleaning up, you know, typical, I think, triggers that people have, things that get me upset at other people. Uh, I think it was breaking the log jam of allowing myself to cry and just to feel the full gamut of my feelings and letting them pass through me in whatever time it takes. It might be a minute, might be a day, you know? Um, and so all of that has been beneficial for trying to uh, return to uh, that state of self-love. Love it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great answer. Um, okay, so two more things I want to talk about. One thing I want to talk about is the other great thing about bringing love to the body, bringing love to your, your full body, your, your soul, your entire energy body um, is, um, and, and I imagine some of you have probably experienced this, the body loves to talk back. And, uh, and I, um, I'm going to briefly talk about four, three or four things where I felt like the body talked to me. And early on in my journey, um, I had experienced six straight years of chronic neck pain, which I'd been rear-ended in a car crash and was classic whiplash type injury. And so I assumed that's what it was. And I tried everything. I tried massage and ultrasound and acupuncture and chiropractic. I got books on neck pain and did all the exercises faithfully. 
and nothing worked for more than a day or two. And I'd be right back to the severe neck pain. And so one day I go home from work early and I crawl in bed like in a fetal position and I'm in tears. I can't believe I'm gonna have to live this way for the rest of my life. And I say out loud, excuse my French, why the fuck does my neck hurt so bad? <laughs> and then poof, this dream right in my face of a monk pacing back and forth outside my house, a monk in a red robe and a shaved head. And he's just pacing back and forth. And I knew it was trying to tell me something, but I couldn't connect the dots. Like what the hell does that monk have to do with my neck pain? But I knew it was trying to tell me. And so um, I had joined a dream forum at the time and the teacher said, I want you to open to this idea that you have a very spiritual side and you need to let him in your house. And I was like, well, okay, I don't really think that's me, but okay, I'll, I'll have an open mind. And then maybe a month goes by, I have another dream. And this great healer is coming towards me with his hands and he's reaching for my neck. And in the dream, I'm like, oh, thank God, somebody's gonna heal my neck, finally. And as he puts his hand right above my neck, I see an angry old man who lives in my neck that says, get the fuck away. <laughs> and so, so sorry about my French here. Um, but I, what I started to learn from that was I carry resistance in my neck. I carry a lot. Of, and it was a time where everything that could go wrong was going wrong at the same time. And so I have since learned peri, people always have a place in their body that carry resistance. It can be the head, the neck, the shoulders, the upper back, the lower back, the stomach. I think those are probably the most common. And so it's been a learning curve for me, but learning to relax and not resist. And I want to say two years after that, came the final culminating dream where that monk who was outside my house was standing behind me in my office with his heart pierced, looking at me with such love. And I suddenly realized my neck didn't hurt anymore. And so who knew? And so you can imagine that was very encouraging. It's like, wow, I can get a lot of messages about the body through dreams. And um, I have a body that runs hot all the time. And, you know, in the saddle, we don't usually have hot weather, but every now and then we get a spate of a week or two or it's in the 90s or two years ago, it got to be 109 and my house is a rambler. It has a lot of glass and skylights. So it's kind of like an oversized greenhouse when it gets hot outside. <laughs> I was suffering. I was moping around and here comes the stream saying, uh, try turmeric. And I'm like, what, the Indian spice, you know? And so I went and looked it up online, turmeric, nature's anti-inflammatory. And I started putting it in my breakfast, lunch, and dinner, my water. And about two or three days later, it made a remarkable difference. Mm -hmm. And um, last story I'll share really quickly. Um, I um, had to fly. I used to fly 25 times a year. And I had to fly on a business trip from Seattle to Jacksonville, Florida, with a connection to Dallas, all the way there for an appointment the next morning, and then all the way back the next day. And lucky me, I threw my back out the day before the trip. And... Um, and I get up the next morning, hoping for a miracle. No, on a scale of one to 10, my back hurts maybe at a six and I'm, I'm crabby and I'm standing in line, you know, with my boarding pass and my driver's license. And, um, and right when I'm about to hand it to him and I'm stealing myself for this is going to be terrible seeing an uncomfortable airline seat coming and going, you know, with a bad back, I'm not even be able to get out of the seat. All of a sudden, some part of me is humming the tune. Don't worry, be happy in my body. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to describe. And I knew loosely that vibration was healing. And I was like, hmm. And so I started humming, don't worry, be happy, and aiming the vibration to my lower back, all the way to Dallas, all the way to Jacksonville, like in the rental car, in my hotel, and then all the way back. And it's never happened like this before, but my pain went from a six to a one. And I was sure it was going to be a six to a nine. And so, um, these have been my experiences, self-love, body love, connection to the body, let the body speak to you. And, um, and it's been, it's been really fun and interesting. <laughs> no, those are phenomenal stories. Yeah. I mean, just love it. Yeah. And it's, uh, I really, I want to go back to um, what you were saying about how, when you were walking through the mall and you felt the energy just float coming up out of you. It's kind of almost yeah. like you weren't even, it was not even consciously directed. And that's the part right. that was really interesting to me because yeah. we are always told that all we need to do is to be our light. 
And that that being out in the world is how we then help others just by being, literally by being. But I love that you had the conscious awareness of that, that you felt it happening and you saw where your energy was going. Yeah. So I think that's phenomenal. It makes me wonder. So if, if the healing energy was flowing through you and then it wasn't going to everybody, it was going to who needed it. So then I wonder who, if it's not you making the conscious choice, it makes me wonder, is it your healing guide? Is it your angel? Who is pulling that energy through you? Or is it just frequency, right? Is it just that that person was resonating with a type of healing that you could match with healing energy, you know, that they had a need yeah. and you had the puzzle piece. What do you think? What's your opinion? I think it's that last one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in the rare cases that I knew somebody or knew a little bit about them, I think that's exactly it. There was something that I had a match that my guides and their guides worked out a little deal and <laughs> <laughs> and then it would be over in 10 seconds. So uh, yeah, I, that's, and yeah, I was like, I, and so I never knew, but I, you know, I, I sometimes would try to find out more about these people. Like, you know, why this waitress in this Thai restaurant, you know? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. What was the connection? Yeah. yeah super, super yeah. cool. So are you all ready to try one more exercise An yeah. exercise in self-love? We are okay. with you. Okay. This is one I named myself and it's called Soul Cat. And so I want you to close your eyes and um, again, maybe place your hands or your awareness in your heart center and see if you can bring up that felt state of love uh, to whatever degree you can. And maybe even that sense of gratitude for your entire existence. Now, what I want you to do while you're in that feeling state of gratitude, is say your full name out loud three times like this. I'm going to model it. And as you do it, you're saying it with incredible reverence, and you're saying it to your physical body, your soul, your energy body, your ego, your personality, your entire beingness. And so for me, it just looks like this. John... David, Lada, thank you. John, David, Lada, thank you. John, David, Lada, thank you. So just try that yourself, your full name slowly with love and reverence. Thank you. And just when you're ready, open your eyes and... <clears throat> so the first time I did that, you guys will love this. Uh, I have this vision of this big, beautiful, white, fluffy cat. And it's looking at me with such, it looks like this wise old cat. And it's looking at me with such love. And it's, um, its fur is full of glitter and confetti like it had been at some party, you know, confetti had rained down from the ceiling and it looks at me and says, John, all that glittery self-love that repels fleas and other pests. That's all it said. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a true thing. I think the more that you are in that state of self-love um, and that sort of, I'm going to call it glittery joy, the pests of the world don't bother you so much. And I'm probably not talking about people, individuals, but you know, just, um, I'm gonna call it psychic influences. Uh, being in a state of love and joy, there isn't as much pestering you. And that has been my experience as well. And I, I, I love that exercise. And again, that's a simple one you can do for a minute or two anywhere. Just bring your full feeling state and your full gratitude to it. Um, 
And I'll say one more thing really quick. So my understanding, so I wrote this book called The Synchronicity of Love. And after 20 years of all these crazy experiences, my conclusion was, yeah, it's all about a mature balance between masculine and feminine. It doesn't sound very sexy, but I actually think that's where we're going. And um, I, um, I heard somebody say that maybe 10,000 years ago, humans, mankind were primarily feminine or matriarchal. And by that, I meant this profound connection to, uh, to nature, plants and animals and the earth and each other. And then 5,000 years ago, that began to end and we entered what they call the age of the autonomous masculine. And so that sense of profound connection to, to the body, to nature, to earth was lost. And I think where we're going now is a balance between the two, where we are expected to be in our authority and our sovereignty and our autonomy. But I think we're trying to bring back all that we had 10,000 years ago, that profound connection to each other, to the earth, to plants and animals. And, um, and I think the, the dance going forward is going to be able to um, be in your mastery and to balance both of them. And that has been my journey. And um, that was that was the conclusion for my book. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely 100% agree with you and that we're moving into a state where we can actually be more in harmony with the earth and a steward of the earth and be in balance ourselves and be a full channel for that light to bring that divine light down into the earth. Yeah. Super cool, John. So I know that um, if I don't know if you have a copy of your book there that you could hold up and show us the cover of your book. I do. Hang on one sec. And then I'd love for us to hear about, John has a workshop coming up uh, this month um, that uh, if you'd like to have more of this experience, thank you so much. So there's the book. And then can you tell us about your workshop, John? Yeah. On February 25th at my house here in Redmond, um, I'm teaching a workshop called um, Love in Action, Renovating, Rejuvenating, and Revitalizing Your Life. And a lot of what we talked about here in the, the hour, we're going to explore more in depth in that workshop. And if there's any of you that are in the Seattle area or on the east side, you want to join me, I'd love to have you join me. Um, you can find me on my website, johndavidlatta.com, and just click on the events page. It's right at the top of that page. So let's go ahead and put that into the, um, the you, I'm sorry, you said it's a John David Latta is the webpage? Correct. JohnDavidLada.com. All right. It's in the chat. All right. All right, John, super fun session. Loved, absolutely loved hearing your stories and your wisdom. So aligned and uh, really just amazing reminders for all of us. I loved your exercises too. Who didn't love feeling like it's just, we all are leaving here on cloud nine now. <laughs> so yeah. awesome. So thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you sharing that with us. And thank you guys, all of you for being here today. Uh, it's an amazing community of people. The vibe here is always so inspiring. So you guys know we'll be back again next. It's always the second Thursday of the month. We vary the time a little bit based on where our speakers are located, but it's always the second Thursday of the month. So thank you guys so much for coming. And John, many thanks to you. And I'll see you guys again at the next Wisdom Soup. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Right. Lots of yeah. lots of love coming to you in the chat, John. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, you guys.